Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Agroforestry in Action webinar series. My name is Gregory Ormsby Mori. Uh, this series is a production of the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri. I'm the work with the Center for Agroforestry as the Education and Outreach Coordinator, and we run this series uh, approximately monthly. Uh, presentations usually run about 45 minutes and then followed by some question and answer time. Today's presentation, uh, Chestnut Agroforestry in the Northeast. Uh, we are really uh, pleased to have our two speakers, uh, Jono Niger, sorry, Jono Niger. I know Jono from a long time, so I don't know why I mispronounced your name, John. <laughs> and Russell Wallach. Um, so again, uh, today's presentation will run about 40 to 45 minutes and we'll have uh, then some time for question and answer. All presentations in this series are recorded and past presentations are viewable on demand uh, on our website. So check the uh, webinar link on our centerforagroforestry.org website. And you'll also see there a schedule of upcoming uh, webinars. We have a full schedule this fall with uh, webinars every month. So uh, our speakers, uh, Jono Niger. Jono, I mispronounced your name again. I don't know why I'm doing that. Jono. Uh, Quite all right, Gregory. <laughs> That's kind of uh, yeah. John and I are neighbors. We know each other for years, so uh, interesting. Uh, John Niger is a founding partner of the Regenerative Design Group in Greenfield, Massachusetts. He's uh, he has about thirty years of professional experience in areas like permaculture, site planning, agroforestry, conservation, restoration. He teaches at the uh, Conway School uh, and presents regularly at colleges, workshops, conferences around the Northeast region. Before uh, starting the Regenerative Design Group, uh, John also worked as a land manager with the Lost Valley Education Center, he, as a town uh, conservation officer, and as a restoration specialist with the Nature Conservancy. He was a founding board member of the, uh, uh, and president of the Permaculture Association of the Northeast. He's the author of the book, The Permaculture Promise, and he holds a master in, uh, in landscape design from the Conway School and a Bachelor of Science in Forest Biology from SUNY uh, College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Also with us today, Russell Wallach. Uh, Russell is uh, uh, an ecological designer based uh, nearby in, in Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, John, I think you're in Leverett in, in the what's called the Pioneer Valley uh, in Western Massachusetts, both uh, our speakers. Uh, Russell has worked uh, previously with as a designer with groups like Appleseed Permaculture, uh, Terra Genesis, uh, assisting landowners, business leaders, and others to develop their ability to work with living systems. Recently, uh, he has led the development of what's called the Brasa process, and we're going to hear more about that in today's presentation, uh, and uses a uh, watershed level lens to assist brands, companies, brands on their investing and, and, and their supply system. Uh, he is also currently very much focused on working on creating a viable commercial chestnut industry in the Northeast. And Russell also holds uh, a master's from the Conway School in, uh, in their program in sustainable landscape planning and design. So with that, I am going to turn things over uh, to our two speakers. Uh, welcome. Great. Thank you so much, Gregory, and to the Center for Agroforestry for having us. Oh, it's our uh, pleasure. Yeah. Looking so, forward to it. Again, hello from the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, this, this image here on your screen shows, you can see just a little bit um, of the Connecticut River there in the upper left corner. So we're right down in the riparian zone under Mount Sugarloaf, just to give you a sense of what we're looking at. And um, yeah, the, the flow today is going to be, I'm going to give a little kind of high level overview on, on the conversation. <clears throat> specific to the Northeast. And then John is gonna get into some of the details of his project at Big River Chestnuts that we're looking at right here. And really get into some of our, some of the practices and learnings um, from the first couple of years on that site. And then I'll do the same for my site that's in Rensselaer County in New York. Um, and yeah, just cover some kind of practical learnings, challenges faced um, and kind of our best understanding at this point. Um, and I think uh, what's really important to, to just frame this conversation, I don't, at least I'll speak for myself, I don't feel like I'm showing up today on this call as an expert, but more as kind of an eager person who's been doing what he can to learn as much as possible 
about um, how we can grow the chestnut industry in the Northeast and nationally. So just happy to share my learnings and maybe even learn from some of you today during the Q&A session. So with that in mind and kind of this, this idea of how we've been learning and who we've been learning from and who's kind of inspired this work, I just want to give some shout outs to uh, the folks listed here on the screen. Um, and you know, this is, this is dual purpose slide. Um, feel free to screenshot it. If you're someone who's looking to learn a lot more, I recommend all of these people um, and their websites and publications as great resources for learning about the work that has been done in the US, particularly the works since uh, the chestnut blight hit in the early 1900s. Um, and so what we're talking about today, hybrid chestnut. So even um, this is an important distinction. I was just having a phone call with someone on this yesterday that the work we're talking about today is not the forest restoration work that is usually connected to the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, that is not because we are opposed to it, but it is, I would say this is a complementary effort. This is about how do we integrate chestnuts as a tree crop, um, specifically hybrid chestnuts when we're talking about the Northeast. Um, very little American genetics or even European genetics um, are thriving in a Northeast setting uh, because of blight. So this is about how do we integrate hybrid chestnuts into agriculture in the Northeast, not uh, solely the forest restoration project. And if we need to, we can get into that a bit more in the Q&A. So just a, a few quick data points. Um, we currently, and I, there were some questions about demand and marketing. So currently it's about 90% of the annual chestnut consumption is consuming imported chestnuts. Um, so just in terms of a supply and demand relationship, there's already a much greater demand than there is domestic supply here in the US. Um, there are also, only about 4,000 acres of chestnuts in production. And I, within that 4,000 acres, there's varying age and even kind of intensity of commercial production. Um, the number is much smaller if you're looking at people who are like really trying to make a living um, on chestnuts. So there are thousands of acres to be planted before, we, uh, before domestic supply even exceeds the demand for fresh nuts. And as we'll discuss a little bit, we're also looking at kind of a, an additional market, kind of what are the value added products, things like a, thinking of chestnuts as a gluten free flour source that we might move towards as we exceed the demand for fresh nuts. So there's quite a bit of potential to move into. And here in the Northeast, and when I say Northeast, I'm uh, kind of tying together New England, New York, and Pennsylvania is, is what I'm using as a reference for the Northeast. Um, and what we've mapped is about 15 to 20 farms with trees planted on them, covering about 30 to 40 acres in the whole Northeast. Um, most of these farms are fairly early stage. Um, if they're not, if they're above five years, many of them are still in the five to 10 year window where yields are really in a significant growth stage. Um, and interestingly, we have ID'd individual trees that are producing as much as 40 to 60 pounds per tree. And, and to give you a sense of what that means, um, a mature orchard is, is around 50 trees an acre. So if, if we could get to a point where we had identified genetics consistently producing as much as 40 pounds per tree, we'd be looking at 2,000 pounds an acre. You know, that, that's kind of what, where we're hoping to get to. Um, orchards across the U.S. have produced at that level. Um, there's varying degrees of success of producing consistently at that level. Um, and just since spring of 2018, Jono and I have combined to plant about 16 acres um, between Rensselaer County and Hampshire County here in Massachusetts. This is just a quick map of some of the distribution of farms um, with chestnuts on them here in the Northeast. Um, there's a, a bit of a, a node in the Connecticut River Valley, and then this kind of Hudson Valley corridor, and then again in the Finger Lakes region um, are kind of the three nodes that we've identified where there's a little bit of a density of producers. And in terms of just thinking about kind of the energy around this idea, um, it's a very compelling conversation for folks is what we've found so far. Uh, some of these images here are actually illustrating a community chestnut brunch we had with about 20 different dishes, all using chestnuts in one way or another. We have uh, some crepes here. We have a chestnut porridge with some topping, some different other perennial crop toppings, um, a, a braise, a, a brisket miso braise that I, 
did with chestnuts. Um, and out of that brunch, actually three articles. Um, so we intentionally invited a number of journalists and three articles uh, were published, two in a local paper and then um, the one above, Let's Farm Chestnuts Again, was published in the Wall Street Journal um, based on the meal they had had and the conversations we had at that brunch about the role that chestnuts can play in kind of a perennialization of agriculture or, or an increased use of tree crops within our uh, domestic agriculture system. So I'm going to just pass it over to Jono to drop right into a little more specificity of what we've been working on. Okay, great. Thanks, Russell, and thanks everybody for being here. And uh, excited to share with you what uh, I've been working on for uh, last couple years. Uh, this particular site on the banks of the Connecticut River, as Russell said, below Mount Sugarloaf. So this is a seven acre, seven acres of a ten acre property uh, that I took a lease on. Uh, in the riparian zone of the river. Um, it's uh, um, just in its preliminary stages and you can kind of see the layout there. That uh, white flexinet fencing is the chicken rotational grazing zone uh, that we'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, and you can see the north-south rows. Uh, the larger tree growth in the field there is actually in between the chestnut rows. And so we'll take a look at that as part of the um, vegetation management uh, um, that we're doing. And so this is a kind of an overview aerial photo meant to communicate some of the ideas around the management of the field. Uh, so the northern part there uh, with the alley cropping, the north-south tree rows and um, the space in between and the rectangles there showing some of the um, rotational grazing. Uh, and then the future potential for a civil pasture where the trees are wi more widely spaced uh, after thinning out. Uh, and as well as management of the stream channel, which is to the east and curving to the south there. Uh, and, um, and then also um, um, sort of management and stewardship of the riparian buffer along the river as well. And then the upper right of that, uh, you can see a barn there that's available uh, on the property for uh, processing and storage uh, um, as the crops come in uh, and the potential for a future sales uh, location. All right, so this, uh, this is sort of a, some of the key uh, aspects of site selection to consider and I can tell, say a little bit about how that affected um, my landing on this property. Uh, so um, important are climate, soils, and pH are really the main ones. And climate, uh, the, um, the Chinese chestnut, uh, Castanea melissima, really does best in zones four through eight. So covers really all of uh, the Northeast um, and, and can do really well in the hot, humid summers that we have here. Uh, soils, really important that it's well drained, uh, that, um, that there's no standing water through the season and, and, and going all the way up to the trees can handle some really tough uh, droughty um, gravel, sandy gravelly soils. Uh, the, the site that I'm on on the side of the Connecticut River is a silt to silt loam. It's a little bit heavy. Uh, it's partly heavy because of the um, generations of tillage that have left very low organic matter levels, so it's um, pretty compacted. So, um, so though it's holding more water now than the trees are probably liking, it's um, as the s conditions have already improved in the year plus that we've been there, uh, seeing better drainage, and I can I expect that to continue um, to improve. But um, uh, so the soil is really important. Uh, that it's well drained. Uh, pH needs to be acidic, 5.5 to 6.5. It can handle it a little more acidic uh, and, and somewhat more basic, but it's definitely um, best to be right within that range. And then slope can vary quite a bit from flat to moderately steep. Even, even fairly steep slopes, it gets more into access at that point and maneuverability and the ability to manage the way 
um, you're needing to manage. Um, and then sunlight, the trees really want full sun. Uh, I'm seeing that some of the trees that are in some part sun or on the edges of the fields are doing pretty good. They're, they seem to be fine, uh, but, but as sunny as possible. Uh, with other factors like access um, and um, maneuverability, the ability to get in equipment and get um, the harvests out is, is important. And so the assessment of a land property is um, super important, either identifying where on a property that you're on is suitable, or if you're thinking about um, um, getting onto a property through a lease or purchase, it's really important to use the, the what's available digitally, like the Web Soil Survey, uh, the website the NRCS has. Uh, there's a lot of information there. Uh, going out on site and digging soil pits, looking at groundwater, looking at the soil, um, observing the vegetation that's growing there, um, mapping out uh, water movement and um, and where the different soil areas are is um, is super important and important to um, get a deep understanding as you get into um, the layout. Okay, so uh, the property that um, I'm um, working on right now, I have a lease on it and um, we, we actually spent quite a bit of time. It was pretty difficult to find information on long-term leases. Um, we used a, a template, a workbook, um, here on the right is the um, um, information, or at least the title, from Farm Commons and Savannah Institute. So shout out to them for a great uh, um, template workbook that um, we used. Uh, the, the, I think the central, the key point is to be sure that you're on the same page if you're going into a lease, a long-term agreement with a property owner, is uh, make sure that you're have the same goals, your your vision is at least aligned uh, so that they would know what they're um, taking, undertaking by giving the use of the land uh, to you. Um, so I was very fortunate to have that with the, the folks, the couple that own the land, they had been previous farmers there and, um, and um, wanted to see uh, long-term cropping with no tillage happening. Uh, so we agreed on um, beginning with a 20-year lease uh, with a right to renew, um, and then also there's a purchase to option, uh, a, a purchase to an option to purchase the property. Uh, the, and and so it's important to know also the um, maximum lease term for your state. It's state by state. In Massachusetts, it's 50 years. Some places it's uh, 99 years. Some places it's 20 years and um, so that's pretty critical to understand um, and so the other aspects of the lease that we wrote in were the permitted uses to be really clear on what could be allowed um, thinking about camping or recreation or um, other uses besides the central farming use um, um, what is the fee going to be based on the the lease fee uh, and we um, developed a base fee um, Pretty much from the taxes and expenses, um, and then um, and then had an allowance for increasing that uh, as there are changes. And uh, my rent fee uh, is right now is forty nine hundred a year uh, for the ten acres, but it includes some parts of the property that are subleased by an adjacent farmer. Uh, the landowner actually um, leases back a barn. So that 4,900 gets reduced um, um, about $1,000 by the, some of the subleases right off the bat. Um, so some other aspects, uh, um, ability to transfer uh, interest um, without even getting approval from the landowner. So should my situation change and I need to bring someone else in, um, um, the ability to sublet. So I have some barn spaces and I, I um, have the ability to um, um, bring somebody in there to help um, pay for costs. Um, and then some of those are all pre written in there that they can, I have those rights I can transfer upon my passing so that um, the investment can continue on. Um, if I have a family member, my son wants to take it on. Uh, one of the complicating factors is this um, 
the first right of refusal that I have is actually superseded by the MDAR is the Mass Department of Ag Resources. They actually own the first right of refusal because it's in this APR program. Um, so that would actually have to be negotiated through the state. Um, so it's really a, one of those important things of really understanding if there's any kind of easements or other um, um, aspects to the deed on a property that you might get into this kind of arrangement and really understand that deeply. Uh, and then we've also written in some strong penalties if the landowner breaks the lease, uh, just to protect my investment, the cost, the time and the money uh, that have been invested, uh, which is pretty significant. And so it's important to have that in there. All right, let's go into a little bit about uh, so specifics of um, design and laying out a planting. So the trees, these chestnut trees that we're talking about, the Chinese chestnuts uh, have uh, 30 to 50 foot height, uh, possibly even taller if they're timber varieties, uh, to a 40 to 60 foot wide. Um, so spacing is going to really take that into consideration. These are really big trees. So the spacing options begin with trying to understand what your goals are and what your kind of trajectory is. The, the, um, the, the options are really, do you want to space them closer to begin with? So I said 20 by 20 here can even be 15 foot spacing. And the, the, the um, benefit there is that the trees are, pollen, um, are closer for pollination sooner and production begins sooner. Uh, the, the harder part with that is that they're going to need to be thinned out and you're, you're going to have to make some decisions um, sooner than later about uh, which trees are the poor, poor quality or poor producers and, and would need to be thinned out. Um, eventually, for a standard operation or for many operations are aiming for around a 40 foot spacing um, of the mature trees and that allows the crowns to be touching. Uh, filling in the space, um, and um, and though that could increase even more depending on if you're doing uh, kind of a civil pasture um, arrangement, which we could talk about a little bit more. So um, there's other other options with that 40 foot spacing, uh, and that's what um, which is to have the in row spacing closer. So my trees are generally 40 foot rows, and 30 feet or 20 feet between the trees in the rows. So there'd be thinning within the rows, uh, but not, um, but still allowing space in between. And we'll look at that when I, we talk about some of the alley cropping. Uh, so here you can see on the photo on the left, um, the, the tree rows um, with the tubes. It's a little bit hard to see. And the tractor tracks in the center are going between the alley crop um, plantings of elderberry. And those are with orange flags, a little bit faint to see, two rows of flags and tree uh, elderberries on either side of the tractor tracks. So what this is, is using this space between the 40 foot rows of trees while they're young, uh, there's a lot of empty space in there. Um, it's going to be a number of years before they really begin to fill in, shade the space. And so there's the opportunity, one is to make some income, to have some additional harvest for the years that the trees are not producing. Uh, and second, um, using that space um, and having it part of the management, part of the soil improvement um, that's happening. Uh, and so in the blocks that I'm beginning to bring this in at Big River Chestnuts, we're putting in elderberry and aronia, a small fruit. And uh, in this picture on the left, there's two rows of small fruit, either side of the tractor tracks that you can see. Uh, those are 10 feet apart. So that will allow for um, mowing um, and with a decreasing width of mowing um, as it, those elderberries and aronia grow in. And then additional management between the row crops, the elderberry and aronia, and the chestnuts. There is plenty of room to, to manage that space. 
For the persimmon and pawpaw, there's one row that's centered between the 40 foot uh, um, tree rows uh, going right down the center um, and, and those are spaced about 20 feet apart, the persimmon and the pawpaw trees. All right, so some other uh, ways that we're utilizing the alleys between the chestnuts. Here is the um, rotational grazing of broiler chickens. And uh, this is a pretty innovative setup that uh, Martin Anderton, who's pictured here uh, with his son Jack as the chicks are arriving uh, and, and being checked out by Seneca the dog. And the chicks are immediately on range. So one of the, um, the ways is, uh, Martin's marketing this is um, chickens on range immediately, even as day old chicks. Uh, then they're um, in a chicken uh, chick range house for four weeks. Uh, and then, then they're moved around for five weeks uh, in the alleys on this setup that you see in the picture above. Uh, and they're um, ranged in a block between the chestnut rows moving every day the shelter that's basically just predator uh, protection, an overhead shelter, and then there's some ropes there to keep predators from coming in, uh, and then flexi net for the ground predators, which we're not having too big of an issue here. There's no problem this season. Um, and so that, that shelter is moved once a day, down that down the row in the alley between the trees uh, and we're just had a great season just finished up a few weeks ago uh, and all the um, chickens were harvested uh, and and it looks like uh, it's really been helpful for both the trees and the grass and the, um, bringing in that kind of organic matter um, so that's one way of ranging uh, livestock through um, a field and then go ahead Russell and that um, sheep silvopasture in UMass. Russell you want to talk about that? Yeah sure so um, last year was in 2018 was the launch of UMass's carbon farming initiative which there was historically a small lot that had been planned out as kind of a uh, forest garden set up at the agricultural learning center and there hadn't really been a management program established there and kind of the complexity of that system and it not really being as much an agricultural system as more of kind of a, a home scale uh, setup hadn't really worked out management wise. And so there was an interest in at this agricultural learning center where students are working on the farm for some of their course requirements, could we design more of a broad acre patterning of agroforestry um, and so what we designed last year is um, 30 foot spacing between row and then 15 foot spacing in row, um, specifically because we're using seedling trees. So they will be thinned eventually to, based on uh, selection for different um, genetics. And then the small livestock program is integrating in with the carbon farming initiative and running sheep uh, through the alleyways. So again, using flexi netting, and the way we designed this was um, kind of contour inspired, but with nice straight um, parallel alleys. Uh, and so with that 30 foot width, they could easily calculate um, paddock size and move that fencing. Um, I think last year they were doing about twice a week. They're now, they've now increased the stocking rate. So um, I'm, I'm not sure, I haven't checked in in the past month to see how that's changed things. But um, in general, they were really happy um, the small livestock program could easily integrate in. The trees did well last year on a fairly wet site, and um, it's become kind of a flagship project at UMass. Um, they've already done things now, like a cool climate meal um, kind of featuring the, the, the lamb products in the dining hall, um, and really starting to educate the 30,000 person student body around carbon farming practices and agroforestry. And I, I think I'd just chime in that it looks like, you know, from, from our read on trialing out the chickens, the sheep, much easier for these new plantings, uh, for the ability to have livestock that can be managed and aren't um, as challenging, particularly thinking about 
um, goats or cattle uh, where the trees just need a higher level of protection. Um, and so this is pretty easy to get started, to have the grazing in between, to have some livestock and the manure um, and, the, and the benefits of the lot to, the, to the trees and to the livestock uh, versus um, something that's gonna be more complicated, which is well worth doing. And um, at the project that um, I'm working on, I can imagine having livestock in a, um, in a future, you know, in 10 to 15 years, once the trees are well established and large enough to handle um, a little bit of um, rubbing on by livestock. Great, John, and then you wanna just talk a little bit about uh, vegetation management? Yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit how we're managing uh, the vegetation at Big River Chestnut. So uh, here on the left is the mower working down the rows. Um, we have a six foot bush hog. Um, it's, it looks pretty wild and kind of um, overgrown, which is partly intentional. One of the strategies here on the right, you can see a recently mowed strip um, adjacent to the woody um, material. And so I've been doing this um, pulsed mowing uh, we're allowing those vegetation to grow in. Um, a lot of those plants, uh, like this Queen Anne's lace, this burst of Queen Anne's lace, are putting a lot of deep roots down into the soil uh, and then coming in and mowing um, just to, to utilize both the biomass above ground and then um, take advantage of their rooting. Even the woodies, like the, the sumac, the box elder, um, and that's what was in that, um, that pass that I did on the picture on the right, um, was to get a lot of that biomass down on the ground. So I'm doing this kind of rotational, come in every two weeks to four weeks, um, and in the center rows, even letting that grow for a year or so, um, and getting that biomass down on the ground. And then uh, the additionally, you can see around the tree uh, that's in the picture on the right, you see the woody uh, mulch ring, uh, uh, wood chips over either newspaper or cardboard. So I, it is important during establishment to reduce the competition around, immediately around a tree, just to give it a chance to uh, root in uh, with less competition. Um, so that I've done uh, now twice around every tree. And I'm between 250 and 275 trees uh, so it's a considerable effort to, to do a mulch ring about every tree, but it's, um, I believe, um, worth it. Um, and then some of the tools, we're using both the brush hog, but also some power equipment like this um, power scythe and a weed whip, as well as just going out and hand um, chopping uh, with a scythe some, some of the um, um, weeds that are coming up around each plant. So really using the plants to do a lot of the soil building work. All right, and then there's a layer of fertility management, uh, which we're um, doing several different things. On the left is the fertigation um, operation where I'm pulling a small 60 gallon tank. It has a little pump on it, and then I can be in the cab of the truck and um, drive the rows and give each tree a treatment um, of whatever's in the tank. And I've been using um, some different biological inoculants, fish hydrolyzate, some kelp, um, other, other things that can be added um, over time as needed. Uh, but a lot of it right now is to stimulate the bio biology of the soil um, and, and to jumpstart um, that because it's pretty dead. Uh, from from the um, tillage history on the property. Some amendments that have been added. Um, and then we'll be doing, um, I've done some preliminary cover crops. We'll be doing more of that, compost, uh, wood chips around the trees, as I mentioned, and doing that mowing management, which is really all part of kind of rebuilding the topsoil, rebuilding the soil biology. And we've gotten a, a, a partnership grant through SARE uh, for the next couple of years to be utilizing these different practices uh, and then monitoring pretty closely what's happening with different soil health parameters, uh, carbon levels, uh, and, and trying to tie what we're doing with this kind of vegetation management and fertility management 
uh, to the um, improvements in the soil that um, we'll see. And so it's good that we're starting with a soil that's um, been pretty heavily used, pretty compacted, low organic matter, low biology, and um, be able to um, use some of these practices to show improvement. And so then I'm just gonna say a little bit about um, the numbers in 2018 where we installed uh, most of the trees. Uh, these are some of the a summary of the costs uh, that we've done pretty good job of tracking. So you can see installation, including the plants fencing and some labor, uh, 9,500. Operations, which is what we did through the year, the this setup of the fertigation and hand irrigation, soil testing amendments, all the equipment that we got um, and, and mowing and some labor at 6,400, some overhead costs, 3,500, a little bit on the infrastructure and the farm building that we're leasing. Uh, so for total expenses over 20,000, we have some sublet um, that income that we're bringing in and that brings the cost to 2,700 per acre. That, I should say, uh, importantly, includes the labor that I paid to have help in planting and um, maintenance, but it does not include my labor. Uh, and so that would add a pretty considerable amount if that was, if that was actually being paid, um, probably upwards of another thousand or more of an acre. Um, so the initial investment of 19,000, um, and I've, work some numbers up trying to um, look at what uh, the, the um, return would be. And I, I'm, I'm estimating that in year five to eight, we would begin to have um, profit, be um, bringing in income more than the expenses going out. Uh, and then eventually um, a payback on those initial years of investment um, somewhere around year 12 estimating that that's when we'd be at about 25 pounds per tree. And I think those are the important numbers that you're trying to, we're trying to get more people to, to be interested in this, more farmers or landowners to plant trees and build up this, this industry in the Northeast. And this is one of the big challenges is this first year to profit. You know, you're not talking till year five, six, seven, or eight. And, um, and it's a, quite a bit of initial investment. So that's, that's one of the things that um, we're uh, working on right now. Great, thanks, Jono. Um, so if everyone bears with me, we got a little bit more to get through here. So I'm, I might need to move a little quickly. Um, and I did drop our emails um, in the chat window and we'll be showing them at the end. So if you have follow up, you know, if you want to get into more detail on any of these topics, feel free to reach out. So quickly, um, Jono mentioned his lease structure. I just want to mention a few other lease structures. Uh, one, one that I'm using and then others um, <clears throat> that colleagues working with chestnuts are using right now. So of course, the simplest one is buying land. Um, simplest, but most expensive and likely most challenging for most folks, including me. Um, the top option here is a revenue share agreement, and this is actually the farm I'm going to talk about in a second that I just established this year is entirely a revenue share lease, which means um, the farmer who owns the land will be paid based on my earnings annually. So um, I really won't have to pay anything for this land until I start to generate uh, chestnut oriented revenue. Um, and so in terms of reducing upfront costs for a crop that already has a bit of a lag to revenue production, uh, this is a pretty exciting option. And to be working with a farmer who's interested in that is, is great. Uh, so we got a 30 year revenue share agreement for this, this project. I also have a colleague in the Hudson Valley um, who is working with folks who are based in New York agricultural districts where they're eligible for ag tax incentives. Um, and so if you're already a working farm, that's not as much an exciting opportunity because you're already secure that ag tax incentive. But in a lot of our northeastern states, we have absentee landowners who like kind of the, the rural aesthetic, but don't necessarily want to be managing land. And to be able to offer them an ag tax incentive and have that be kind of wholly um, your payment for access to the land uh, is really beneficial for for 
uh, beginning farmers. And then the third one is um, Casey Dahl, a farmer in, I believe, Wisconsin, who's doing chestnuts and other tree crops, uh, shared a little bit of information about his lease with me a year or so ago, where he's um, renting just the rows, the strips of land that his trees are planted in, in a pasture system. So as opposed to leasing the entirety of that acre, he's leasing uh, roughly a 10 foot strip that the trees are planted in. So that again, reduces lease costs by reducing the net land uh, in ca uh, captured by that lease. So the other project we're gonna talk about today is um, under my company, Bread Tree Farms, and intentionally plural in that we intend to have multiple farm projects. The first one is in Johnsonville, New York. Um, and showing here a little context just to give a sense of land use. This is pretty different than what the Connecticut River Valley looks like. Um, this is Rensselaer County dairy land. So you're looking at a mix of uh, corn, soy, and hay pretty much. And uh, dairy, as many of you know in the Northeast, is continuing to be a pretty challenging industry to make it in economically. And so um, this first project is an eight acre lease um, in land that was in conventional corn last year. Um, that kind of box that it wraps around is currently in soy production. And so we're moving land that was tilled and sprayed last year into uh, no spray uh, permanent crop production uh, with uh, a cover of perennial ryegrass and white clover, um, which is a suggestion I've, I got from Tom Wall at Red Fern Farm around kind of a, a permanent cover that's gonna help with nitrogen, but also not um, have as much root competition as some other pastures grasses. Um, and again, uh, this is this is from the Brasa project that uh, TerraGenesis launched um, that Gregory mentioned earlier. And so some of what we're doing and thinking about how to create a regional industry, but also how to strategically pursue land opportunities is actually mapping the suitability across watersheds. So this was a GIS analysis that came out of the question where what land is suitable for growing chestnuts. And here we looked at 1.7 million acres of the Connecticut River watershed in Massachusetts, and then classified it across a number of different GIS layers, all of which are publicly available through the state. Um, so um, looking at land use, kind of what's already in agricultural production, looking at slope. Um, generally, we, we actually devalued the flattest kind of valley bottom land that tends to be used for annual ag and be of a higher price point. Um, but, and then we also devalued extremely steep slopes that'd be hard to manage mechanically. Um, and then sorted basically for acidic soils, well-drained soils, um, and a reduced ponding frequency. So another way of mapping uh, well-drained soils to, and, and this actually is a layer we can now overlay in Google Earth with parcel owner data and actually zoom around this watershed and click on different parcels based on the color coding and get a sense of who owns them and even what they're doing with that land um, and their contact information. Um, so we're, I'm also starting to look at doing a similar analysis, mapping only for absentee landowners of a certain parcel size in a number of uh, Hudson Valley counties in New York um, to actually be able to do a mailer regarding chestnut based agriculture, um, specifically going after folks who might be interested in an ag tax incentive uh, to reduce the cost to me as a farmer. And so just, just an image here, uh, me with my parents who were excited to come out and help with this project. This is the first few trees we were getting in the ground and you can see what the land looked like um, as recently as May. And this is a, just another little detail, but one challenge with this project this year is we didn't have access to it until May. And in wanting to seed in a permanent mix, we had to wait until rain subsided so that we could disc in the corn and seed and wait for that seed to establish before getting on to plant, which pushed back our planting season about six weeks, which was a bit of a bummer in that it created a little more transplant shock, um, but overall has worked out all right and, and was worth it for a really healthy relationship with uh, the folks I'm working with there. This is what, what the farm is looking like now as the clover and rye comes in. Um, and I'll get into it in a second, but what you're looking at is a mix of two different varieties of tree tube, as well as welded wire caging. And so uh, the two things I'm, I'm gonna focus on here, just to end the presentation, are uh, 
how we're thinking about seedling genetics and seed genetics in the Northeast and how um, I'm experimenting with tree protection. So based on the, the conversations I've had with other commercial growers in the US, um, really the feeling is that we don't yet have um, suitable cultivars that when grafted in other regions um, and then moved into the Northeast are consistently producing in the same way they were in their home region. So for example, the University of Missouri has an amazing cultivar trial site, um, but when they've actually moved some of those grafted cultivars into other climate zones, they haven't produced in the same way, or if someone was uh, buying them to be an early ripening tree that hasn't always held um, steady in other regions. And so the suggestion from folks like Greg Miller at Empire Chestnuts and Tom Wall at Red Fern Farms is really to source um, seedling genetics from really well-producing mother trees. Chestnuts tend to be truer to seed than some of our other tree crops like apples. And so you can select from those mother trees, plant the seedlings and see, and then the idea is let's map what seedlings, what genetics are actually thriving here in the Northeast and producing well. And then from there, maybe we can start to consider kind of the regionally appropriate grafting. Um, this isn't to say that grafted trees don't work in the Northeast, but in kind of the interest of long-term industry development and success, I'm, I'm investing more in genetic diversity and testing for what's gonna work best here. Um, so some of the seed seedling sellers that I've purchased from are um, Empire Chestnuts and Twisted Tree. I haven't purchased from Red Fern Farms myself, but they're highly recommended by other growers uh, domestically, and that's to actually buy one or two year old trees. Here's a site um, where I raised my trees for a year until I had land to plant them out on in orchard spacing. And then what I've also done is source seed genetics to produce my own seedlings. So this is actually at the UMass site here. It's a couple hundred seedling trees that really took off in a mature sheet mulch patch that had a nice six inches of broken down organic matter. Um, and the other image here is showing a bucket where I stratify the seed. So if you're going to buy seed to make your own seedlings, you actually have to store them um, in sub 40 degree temperatures over winter. So what I did this year is I buried about 4,000 seeds in a sandy mixture from a, a, just from a sandy soil in these buckets, buried them about two feet underground, left them all winter, dug them up in March, and they were already sprouting radicals. Um, and I had about a 95% success rate with germination on those, which is uh, really the best I've had in the four years I've tried it. So that, that method has worked better than a walk-in cooler for me. Um, and then some of the other seed sources, in addition to the ones I just mentioned for seedlings, the Uver University of Missouri does sell seed from their cultivar trials. You can either buy them named or in bulk unnamed. Um, and then I've also sourced some seed now from a few different regionally productive trees that I've mapped. And then quickly about tree protection, um, I currently am trying tree pro shelters and plantro tubes. Um, the main differentiation so far, and again, this is just through the first growing season, the plantro tubes are having uh, more vertical growth, but they also um, were much easier to install. Uh, the tree pro took quite a bit of time because you're actually wrapping the tube and then zip tying it to itself. Um, and the question is though, is the accelerated growth rate of in these tubes actually beneficial to the long-term success of that tree? So these trees in the tubes compared to the wire cages are growing much faster vertically, um, but they're not um, taking on as much wind pressure to the tree itself. The tube is, is blown over sometimes, which is a problem in itself. Um, but the tree isn't moving in the wind and, you know, potentially getting the strengthening of the trunk and its root systems in the face of the wind. So I've seen much slower growth with the welded wire cages that we were kind of a DIY solution, um, much slower vertical growth. But my hypothesis is that the, the trees are probably going to be healthier uh, in, the near, in the next few years and then potentially long term. But that's the hypothesis that we're testing. Um, we planted at triple density with an expectation to thin out two thirds of the trees from within every row. So alternating tree tube and cage will allow us to see what succeeds and then thin from there. 
And then um, just for establishment costs, John already shared a bit here, but from my analysis of this year, the major drivers that are gonna vary your establishment costs are what you're paying for a tree. So my estimate for the seedling, the seeds that I've purchased and the seedlings I've produced from them is that that could be as low as 25 cents to 50 cents a tree, whereas seedling costs are in the six to $10 range and grafted cultivars tend to be more in the 20, $25 per tree. That said, when you're planting seedlings, um, you're, I at least am planting much more densely. So I'm doing 100 trees an acre with an expectation to thin um, versus 50 trees an acre is what you would probably do if you're planting grafted trees. Um, and then also the tree protection costs, you know, whether you're doing deer fencing on a small site or doing individual tree protection, there's a bit of variability. And then as John, John mentioned, labor costs. Are you, are you paying yourself? Are you doing volunteer tree days for people excited about tree crops or are you paying labor? Um, I, I used a mix. Um, I had a lot of friends excited about this project who want to be out there supporting. Um, and then I did most of the labor myself. And so then the, the outcome there is, um, it was a, it's about a thousand to four thousand dollars per acre. If you're kind of bootstrapping it, it can be much more expensive if for example, you're hiring a landscape design firm uh, like Regenerative Design Group or Appleseed Permaculture to lay out the orchard and do the install themselves. You know, you, then you're paying for their services and that can increase it. Basically my costs were about 3,000 an acre. That's where I calculated every hour at $15, even if it was mostly my time, just to have an accurate concept. And based on this year's analysis, I see where I could make some savings. And I think if I wasn't paying myself, I could get it as low as $1,000 an acre. Um, but, but realistically, we should all be considering the cost of labor um, in long-term planning. And that, that's about $2,000 an acre. So speeding through the end there, again, please feel free to reach out with questions. Um, and there's a lot more to come. We're early stage in all this. And there are folks who've been working on it for decades. Um, some of the things that I'm really interested to keep looking at is uh, taking the work of Michael Phillips for uh, tree fruit orchards and thinking about kind of what is a holistic orchard strategy for chestnuts, what are the companion plants, how are we bringing in beneficial insects, um, finding strategies to offset the challenges of access to land, that some of the least suggestions, um, is some of the ideas we've talked about, I know Savannah Institute is looking into this, that as well identifying productive genetics, uh, and then long-term tree, protect tree protection trialing and trialing efficient harvesting and processing. Great, so with that, um, I think we're open to questions. And I don't know, Gregory, if there's anything you want to introduce to get Sure, us. hey, Russell and, and Jono, thank you so much. This is a really informative presentation. I'm, I'm really uh, impressed with your uh, pioneering work there in the Northeast on chestnuts. Um, uh, I had the pleasure of visiting both your sites last year and I look forward to getting back there soon sometime and, and seeing uh, seeing the progress. Um, <clears throat> so we do have time for some questions and, and uh, I think what uh, uh, what we can do, folks who are still uh, with us and, and listening, if you have any questions, please go ahead and just type them in the chat box and I'll work with you, Russell and Jono, to sort of vet them um, as they come in. Um, so... <clears throat> But maybe I'll ask a question or two while some uh, our, our participants are, are sending their questions in. Um, maybe I'll start with a, a, a big question and and uh, and, and have a few uh, more pointed questions. But Russell, on the vision of, of a, a viable chestnut industry for for the region or, or, or sub region, do you have an idea of what uh, kind of number of producers or what kind of acreage of production might make a good or optimal sort of number? Uh, or concentration for for grouping together and investing in in say the equipment or or forming a hub you know investing in equipment for harvesting and processing. Uh, I suppose that could be done at different scales, but do you have an idea of what what your vision of what the right kind of optimal scale would be for acreage and, and number of growers? Um, I don't know that I actually know enough to say optimal scale. Necessarily. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But. Um, one of the data points I've heard from Greg Miller, I believe what the number he threw out there was 50 acres was mm -hmm. enough for him to justify the processing facility he set up. I see. Yeah. And that, that was pretty, you know, DIY and entrepreneurial on his part. 
Mm -hmm. um, another conversation I've had, I actually spent some time in the major chestnut growing region of France, mm. where uh, a young guy from that region who wanted to revitalize their industry, where they have you know, these 400 year old forests, um, he over the past 20 years has developed a site that does about 2 million in revenue processing about 300 tons a year. And he did that for 500,000 euros. Hmm. Um, so, you know, a, not a small number, but for the scale of what he is going through his site every year. And also I know he got significant grant funding. Um, I, it doesn't, it's not, we're, you know, we're not talking about thousands of acres. It's, hmm. I would say it's more in the like 50 to hundred acre scale. Right. To justify that work. Right. If, if Greg Miller sort of bootstrapped and kind of, as you say, DIY at, at, at about 50 acres, uh, so, you know, uh, it's not unrealistic to, you know, seven, you know, over the course of the next few years have few participant growers, you know, on scales of five to 20 acres to in a few years get to a point where you would have enough density or concentration to, to warrant coming together and investing in some of that, that capacity. Yeah, I think we're well on our way here in the Northeast. Hmm. Honestly, you know, it's, it's a small harvest season. So as long as you have cold storage, um, you know, we could all be centrally processing in the Northeast. It's, you know, one big drive. Mm, a year. Mm. So um, I know some of the folks in the Finger Lakes region have been looking at a cooperative project already. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know where that stands. Wow. Um, well, I, I have a few other questions, but let's see if there's some coming in from the uh, participants here. Uh, if you're able to scroll through some of those, uh, I think there's one there. Uh, uh, Did Jono add in potential profit from small fruits while uh, his chestnuts mature and until the chestnuts shade the smaller fruits? Do you see that question from Thomas Sullivan uh, about uh, potential, you know, adding into your financial model, your, uh, uh, your, your, right, right. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Great, great. great. Well, thanks. I think, um, so I don't have those numbers uh, that I've worked up yet. So, and, and the way that I'm adding in the blocks of small fruit, which I didn't get into too much, is um, I'm taking blocks of the um, alleys. Basically, um, it ends up being about 20 by 100 feet, and then planting those in as I'm able to uh, um, get the material. So the, the early blocks of the Aronian elderberry are allowing me to um, propagate from those. I should be able to plant those out, um, divide plants from those and, and plant them next spring. So it's a good question. I haven't done that. Um, it's, it's definitely, those are, I'm estimating to be able to come into production partly in year two, but then by year three be fully on. So that's um, to be continued. I'll have to give you an update as we get those numbers. Yeah, thanks, Jono. Um, I'm going to just uh, select a few questions here, Jono and uh, mm -hmm. Russell. Um, <clears throat> there's one straightforward question about: Do we do we have an idea of the northern limits of the range in the Northeast? You know, how far can we viably take uh, chestnuts uh, for commercial production? I'm imagining. Um, I, I'm not sure if it would extend all the way into northern Vermont and Maine and into Quebec. But uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Their chestnuts growing up into northern Vermont, you know, they can handle zone four. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that once you're um, getting, what is that, minus 20, minus, and so zone three, zone three areas where you're into Canada, um, I think they'll start to drop out. Russell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I know one resource around cold hardy uh, chestnuts would be um, Buzz Fervor at, I think it's Perfect Circle Farm. Um, Buzz has been selecting genetics from all over and is in the Berl generally like Burlington area. Um, so he's not all the way up, uh, up to the border there, but um, he's got quite a few chestnuts on site and would be a great resource on that. So I think, I think if you look up Perfect Circle Farm, you'll find them. Mm. Yeah, there was one other question from Hoy on uh, plans for processing. Uh, uh, I think we, we touched on that, Russell, but I don't know if you want to uh, touch any more on, 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 on that topic. 
Sure. Yeah, so ch chestnuts domestically are kind of a funny situation with regard to processing where, again, the demand is so high domestically for fresh nuts that there isn't actually that much incentive initially or at this moment for farmers to invest in value adding value added right. products. Yeah, same issue here in Missouri and in, in, in other growers around the region. It just, you know, they can't grow enough chestnuts for, to sell for the, the demand for the fresh market. And it just, it just wouldn't, you know, the economics, as you mentioned, is just not there to invest in the processing equipment. And I think it's the kind of thing that in the long term, you know, for if we want to get to hundreds of thousands of acres, we're going to need to have those value added products and, and gluten free flour mm -hmm. kind of products. Um, so the processing, like kind of the bullet points on processing is there's a need to sort the nuts in terms of uh, mold or if they have chestnut weevils in them. Mm -hmm. um, if you're then processing them, uh, drying the nuts and then shelling them after that, after they've kind of separated from the shell a little bit, um, mm -hmm. and then sorting again based on the quality of the nut meat after it's been dried, and then milling um, is kind of like, that's a very, you know, Cliff Notes version of, um, of the processing cycle right. there um, that I've seen in a few different places. Um, and again, I think that would be the kind of thing that's really interesting to get some of the government grant funding involved in. So it's not, you know, farmers who, are unnecessarily investing in this equipment, but you know, getting like rural development office and, and folks like that to support that mm. kind of infrastructure. Great, yeah, thank you, Russell. Hey, uh, John O and uh, Russell, there's another question from John Porterfield here, and he's asking about pest problems. Uh, and specifically, he asks, have any omnivore insects showed up uh, and found your orchard and required any response? And are um, and the second half of the question is about pests that specialize on chestnut. And uh, uh, and uh, be, I, I would interject that our uh, chestnut growers guide on our Center for Agriforestry.org website does have information about pest uh, problems in chestnuts that may or may not be uh, relevant for, for your areas in, in, in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sure, I could say that uh, there's, there's the primary pest that is um, in chestnuts in, in uh, North America is the chestnut weevil, uh, which, which um, go, the, the um, larvae go into the chestnut and um, burrow around. Um, they damage the inside of the nut and then they um, exit the nut when the ground, when the nut falls to the ground after it falls out of the burr and go into the ground and complete the life, their life cycle there. So um, it's definitely an issue, uh, and it's an issue of um, um, need to interrupt that pest cycle. There's some really innovative ways that um, people have worked out to, to do that. And one is just a um, hot water bath. Uh, so Greg Miller and Route 9 Collective uh, takes the nuts um, quickly after they've been harvested and dunks them in hot water um, I think it's about 140 for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and uh, to kill the larvae but not kill the nut. Um, and um, so there's there's some things to be worked out. Uh, and 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 one indication there is that having chickens uh, on the field, uh, if you could have the, enough coverage by chickens, that that could be another way to interrupt the pest cycle for those weevils while improving the orchard um as well so hmm. interesting yeah, yeah. anything the, out there russell yeah i would say regarding weevils the kind of anecdotally just from my time in a few different orchards some of which are lesser managed than others um that orchard hygiene seems to be really important in the in the weevil life cycle so if you're not harvesting all the nuts or in some of these kind of like abandoned orchards i found mu a much higher density of weevils, um, again, because if you don't harvest the nut, then they can then they crawl out and burrow into the ground and, and hatch the next spring. So I think that John, like John said, the addition of chickens to break up that life cycle mm. and then orchard hygiene is really important. Great. Um, yeah. and it looks like it looks like uh, T R Coulter. I think that's Tracy Coulter uh, dropped a note: 120 degrees for 20 minutes. Um, also, I know. The French also do a room temperature bath where um, they just leave the nuts for specifically nine days 
um, and any nut that is floating after nine days is is thrown out, um, and and then they, and then they just dry them from there. Um, hey, uh, I thought maybe to follow up, uh, maybe specifically uh, on on the, the the livestock and the poultry. Um, uh, on on your site, Jono, you've got the the poultry rotation. At the uh, other site with Russell, you've got the, the sheep. I had some questions about that. Uh, the, it seems like the chicken maybe was just, uh, the poultry was the first year. For for future years, are you planning on maybe expanding that with additional cycles and uh, maybe increasing the the, the stocking level? Um, maybe having mul multiple cycles of of, of uh, broilers throughout the year. I don't know how many your season will, will allow. Um, and what about, would there be opportunities for maybe integrating the poultry and small ruminants in a, in a, in a leader follower uh, arrangement? Would there be any benefits from that? Yeah, I think those are all um, in the works. The, we're definitely ramping up the, the chicken operation. Uh, Martin is sort of, um, he's been um, developing the systems, getting, getting this down. So this was a kind of a first year pilot of us working together, working uh, the chickens into um, the, the needs that I had. And it was great because we had to work out, you know, exactly where the poly net goes and needing to maintain access for the fertigation and the mulching that I'm doing. So in this, this is basically a, um, a um, shared um, sort of a collaborative setup. And so we started small. I imagine next year, I, I think that he'll be doing, um, bringing on chicks at, um, so after they're in the chick house for four weeks, then another round. And so every um, three to four weeks, another round of chicken, right. and okay. then they'd be out on the um, pasture in numerous different setups in the different blocks. Mm, I see, yeah. And yeah. a lot of opportunity for combining the, the um, chickens with the um, sheep either, um, so the chickens coming in after the um, at that point, it's really just a matter of management time and, and um, whoever's tracking the livestock um, and making sure that it's, they're, they're getting moved at the right interval. So that's really our main limitation is the people time on site and none of the farmers, myself included, live on the property. Mm. So there's a, um, just the challenges there. Right. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Jono. Uh, I think uh, maybe if, yeah, if, uh, have time for another question or two uh, and then we'll wrap things up. Uh, I do want to go, go just quickly, uh, Russell, the, it, with the Brasa uh, 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 tool uh, and the maps you showed, just wondering, the gray areas, uh, were those just areas that were not yet classified or to be determined, or is it presumed that the gray areas are, are, are not suitable? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, so I kind of breezed through that uh, presentation on Brasa. We normally do an hour on just Brasa. So, <laughs> um, so the gray areas, the first question we asked was about land use. And we took data available on a, a land use assessment. And we excluded, so the first thing we did was exclude a whole bunch of properties based on land use. So like if it's urban land, you know, specifically uh, has a building on it, um, like a if the building basically takes up the whole property or if it's residential land, if it's a public park, um, if it's state owned land, because in Massachusetts, uh, you can't get a lease for longer than five years on state owned land. So it's not really, doesn't really work for agroforestry. Mm. Um, so there, there's a whole bunch of reasons, but basically we eliminated all that. And then we eliminated anything under five acres because a lot of the agricultural programs, uh, NRCS grants, but also agricultural preservation uh, mandate a minimum of five acres. Um, and then we eliminated all water bodies and a buffer zone around those water bodies. So that all, all of that that was eliminated is what's in gray. And mm. then we only classified what remained after that had been done. So right. we, we initially eliminated, I think, something like 92% of the land base and then classified within that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Russell. Yeah. Um, well, uh, perhaps uh, one more question. Robbie Coville uh, just asked if there's any more public documentation for the bread tree farm or the Big River chestnuts uh, that might be available, whether management plans or, or other uh, kinds of documentation or more detailed uh, uh, 
video or other production that one could see. Uh, you see that question there, and he, uh, and or I think he, Robbie's probably also looking for resources that would help uh, with uh, those thinking to uh, take on uh, chestnuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would take a look um, that slide that Russell put up that has some resources. Um, a lot of those uh, places have websites and there's a few management documents uh, that that uh, that are out that um, have sort of written up some of the information that we presented here. Uh, there's there's more and more that's being developed over time as part of the grant that we're doing on soil health and carbon sequestration. We'll be writing up um, practices and and um, the different soil health parameters and how they've changed over time. So I'd say stay tuned. Uh, the the Facebook group there um, that that uh, is posted all about chestnuts is pretty amazing. That's a huge resource there, and I would say just about all the chestnut growing community. Um, in North America and beyond is on there. And so if there's questions that come up, it's amazing uh, the, the response and detailed responses that you can get there. So um, there's a need for more documentation and I'd say that's a work, works in progress. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Jono. Uh, that was a great presentation and, and, and useful discussion. Folks are welcome to visit our website, centerforagroforestry.org and see some of the uh, resources we have on chestnuts, including Grower's Guide, but again, keep in mind that, that much of that is, is Midwest or, or Missouri specific. Um, and I do encourage you to follow up with Russell or Jono. They've provided their emails if you have any further questions. Uh, my apologies to Corey. We punted your question about the Northwest. Uh, be in touch with my, myself or, or, or Jono and Russell, and we'll try to steer you to any uh, resources we can think of in the Pacific Northwest that could advise on chestnuts. Uh, but uh, Gregory, one one resource really quick is um, go ahead. I believe it's Lad Hill, L A D D Hill, is just outside of Portland. I know that's one commercial orchard in the Northwest that might be a good resource. Oh, good. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I'm not knowledgeable, so uh, but uh, if if um, if you do, Russell or John, I have any any. Uh, additional uh, resources, maybe Corey could, could follow up with you. But I uh, just want to thank you again, Jono and, and Russell, it was a great presentation and useful discussion. Uh, folks, thanks for joining us uh, for this, this uh, webinar presentation. It has been recorded and will be available for future viewing on uh, our website. You can check the webinar link on centerforagroforestry.org where you'll see all past uh, webinars, recordings of all past webinars and also a schedule for upcoming webinars. So uh, thanks once again. Please join us. Uh, uh, next uh, presentation will be September 11th. Eduardo Samariba will be talking about coffee agroforestry in Central America. Um, once again, this is the Agroforestry in Action webinar series, a production of the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.